so uh, good morning everyone so we are yet in another wonderful uh, panel discussion now from morning we are having uh, great panels this is one more uh, exciting panel that we are going to talk about we are going to talk about reglobalization and the role of lawyers in reglobalization so everyone must have heard about uh, globalization uh, there are new terms that are coined every day what is reglobalization and what exactly will be the uh, role of lawyers in a reglobalized world so let me start off very briefly and then maybe i'll introduce my co-panelist so first is uh, we have heard of globalization in 20th century but what exactly is uh, reglobalization after globalization there was a dip of globalization again now it is picking up so that is exactly what a reglobalization uh, is about we will talk in more detail about reglobalization re in this panel so let me take the privilege of introducing my co-panelist, uh, Professor Dr. James uh, Sain and uh, Pranay. So uh, pr just if you could uh, spare a uh, few minutes in introducing yourself. Um, my name is James Nedumbara. Uh, I'm heading the Center for Trade and Investment Law, uh, which is an agency uh, established by the government of India. So I'm also the WTO chair professor at the uh, Center for Trade and Investment Law. So I basically work on international trade investment, uh, then free trade agreement negotiations. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I am Dr. Sayan Das, uh, Associate Professor of Law, School of Law, Galgautia's University. Uh, I'm happy to be in the, the panel because uh, I am having seven years of litigation and seven years of academics. Uh, and my name is Prani Lekhi, and I am still an associate at Allen Novri, where I practice public international law and international investment arbitration. So, great. So, uh, I heartily welcome uh, my panelists. So, now let me start off uh, with uh, some b basic question. We have heard about uh, globalization, and we are now talking about uh, re-globalization word that is being uh, you know, coined right now. And we are also talking of lawyers. How does lawyers and uh, re-globalization fit in? What is the role of lawyer in this uh, revised, <coughs> you know, uh, talking of re-globalization? Um, if I can start off with uh, you, Professor Dr. James. Yeah. Can I use that? Yeah. yeah. Is it working? Um, Thank you, Chair, Mr. Sadish, and um, wish you a happy Constitution Day. It is a great uh, occasion for our country that we are actually celebrating the drafting of the Constitution. So let me come back to the, you know, the meaning of the term globalization. First of all, nobody actually knows what is actually globalization. So there is a definitional issue. But I can tell you one thing, that globalization basically means enhancing efficiency. So we have been talking about technology for one matter. So technology basically enhances, or it, it, it basically improves efficiency. Then we are talking about you know, reducing the barriers to movement. So in olden times, it was very difficult for people to actually move from one place to another, forget about moving between continents. Now we can actually move from one continent to another in such a short time. The factors of production can be relocated very efficiently. So in one way, when we really look at globalization, it's basically, in a way, pooling together the resources of the world to make sure that we can actually provide, you know, make it good or provide a service or get a task done at the earliest. So this globalization has been, as I mentioned, has been, um, you know, has been evading a proper definition for a very long period of time. And some people said that globalization is actually bad for many communities, many cultures for that matter. Because what we have seen, some of the technological advanced countries like the United States, or maybe some of the European countries, they have been at the forefront of globalization because 
their companies, their institutions had that kind of a dominance. So in, in many ways, globalization also entails some kind of a transportation of norms, transportation of norms across various countries and jurisdictions for that matter. In some ways, it actually created so much uncertainty among certain people. And now we are talking about re-globalization because the original proponents of globalization have now understood that this globalization is not something great for them as well. And that is why we have got the new term called re-globalization. What is actually re-globalization? Some people say that re-globalization is actually the result of, you know, the, the great political and economic rivalry between two great economic superpowers. One is actually the United States and the second is China. And these two countries actually reflect two different systems. One is actually a democracy, the other is, you know, some people call it a socialist country with capitalist characteristics. Some people say it is a capitalist country with social characteristics, but nobody knows what it is. But we know for sure that it is actually an auto, an auto, you know, a dictatorial country for that matter, where things can be done very efficiently. There is a unitary structure. Uh, there is a very, very strong chain of command in their particular economy, and they have done phenomenally well. So China is actually one country that has really benefited in the last maybe four, two decades, or maybe you can say four decades, from globalization. On the other hand, the United States was the country that actually drove globalization for a long time. And now we have got a particular crisis. And we saw this crisis during uh, the COVID period. What actually happened during the COVID period? You know, the COVID, uh, the pandemic basically spread across the world. And many countries actually believed that the globalization is also not a great idea. Because if you want, you know, at that particular time, the focus was actually on vaccines, uh, medical devices, personal protection equipment, or so PPE for that matter, raw materials. There was a huge amount of disruption in global supply chain for that matter. So every country thought that we have to be, we have to be resilient. And then, you know, we have got, we have come across new terms like French shoring and near shoring. It is actually very risky for countries to, you know, source inputs and production, of, uh, I mean, factors of production from distant locations. Let us actually keep in jurisdictions that we trust. So in a way, that is, why, that is what is leading to resilient global supply chain for that matter. But what is happening here is that, you know, when we think about globalization, we have to understand that globalization is also about people. The people, I mean, so in many cases, when you know, economic production became very efficient, certain people in certain parts of the world lost their employment. They found that, OK, uh, some of their core industries have actually relocated to other jurisdiction for that matter. So globalization is basically very much you know, agnostic. It is agnostic to technology. It is agnostic to everything for that matter. It is agnostic to your culture, your identity for that matter. When all these things happen all of a sudden, and I, I would like to use the term disruption. When disruptions all ha you know, happen all of a sudden, human beings find it very difficult to adjust. And especially in the, in the context of everyone, let us actually think about a lawyer. If I'm a lawyer doing a particular kind of a practice, and if a disruptive practice, you know, a trend happened in that, in that profession, I will find it extremely difficult to adjust. I can't actually change my profession overnight. In the case of industries as well, they can't change their production uh, networks, their uh, you know, production lines overnight. So the adjustment is a major issue. And that is why, while globalization has been a force for good, Many countries have been trying to resist globalization. Let me tell you, the, the general you know, urge within human beings is actually to destroy globalization. Nobody really wants to actually embrace globalization. When we think about movement of people, so let us actually think and assume for a minute that Indian nurses or Indian lawyers are really the smartest. They are actually the cheapest in terms of their, their billing. But will the UK or even the United States accept them all of a sudden? No. They want to have this kind of you know, uh, visa re restrictions. They want to actually have economic needs trust requirement. Why? Because they want to protect their own people as well. So in a way, I think you know, while globalization has been a great idea, all throughout the last four decades, we can say there has been a resistance. And there has been concerted effort to destroy globalization as well. Let me tell you, it is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that you know, uh, globalization in, in all its sense is actually a good thing. No. But at times, we can also undo or undermine the benefits of globalization through restrictive trade practices and policies for that matter. That is something which one has to be very careful about. 
Because at the moment, what we are seeing is that on the technological front, there is significant amount of disruption, huge amount of innovation happening. But when we think about global political institutions, they are actually at the very bottom of the recession. What do I mean by that? You know, the international collaboration within these kind of you know, institutions of global economic architecture is almost broken. You know, there's an organization called the WTO, and there is an appellate body in the WTO to hear the disputes. That appellate body has been dysfunctional for the, four, the last four years. Why? Some countries do not want a proper dispute resolution for their matters. So in a way, I think, uh, you know, when we really look at the trends happening around the world, uh, there has been a resistance, there has been a challenge, or you can say there, has, there is an attempt to reset globalization. And that is also creating a huge amount of uh, tensions for that matter. So now when we think about re-globalization, what is the role of lawyers? Let me tell you, when we think about a new sector, like artificial intelligence, let me talk about you know, electronic commerce or data protection for that matter. The policy making is one aspect. A policy making will always be done in order to encourage the domestic industry, or sometimes to you know, enhance welfare as well. But the lawyers will have to be working in tandem with the policy makers to make sure that the laws have got a moral content. The laws have got an ethical content for that matter, because law is just a system of rules. 